Hello and welcome to the Wellbeing College. Our aim at the college is to help you learn how to best take care of your mental well-being. We do that by providing learning opportunities where people can come together and explore resilience and positive mental health in the Scottish borders. My name is Annette Murray, one of the personal tutors at the college, and today I'm going to take you through a course called What is Mental Health Recovery? This is an online self-study version of the What is Mental Health Recovery course we run regularly in person throughout the borders. You can find out more about this and other courses at the college on our website www.wellbeingcollege.org.uk. You can also make an appointment with a personal tutor to better understand how the college can help you. If this is something you think might benefit you, please get in touch. Our website should have all the information you need about the college, who we are, what we do and how we can help you. But if you have any more questions, please call us or drop us an email. We're always happy to talk to our students. In this course, What is Mental Health Recovery? We are going to look at some of the key principles that help support our mental health and well-being at all times, but especially when times are tough and we're looking to find ways to help us manage. By the end of the course, you will hopefully have a clearer picture of what mental health recovery means. Appreciate what mental health recovery means to you. It is, after all, a very individual concept. Have a basic appreciation of the CHIME principles, which will be explained soon, and discover initial steps you can take to apply the CHIME principles in your own life. This is a general introduction to some key ideas which you may find helpful and wish to think about some more. Sources of further information will be provided at the end of the course if you wish to explore these ideas further. Before we begin, it's important to be clear that this is a general introductory course. We share broad themes and strategies that can help when it comes to understanding and improving mental health. We encourage you to think about how the ideas in this course can work for you. We acknowledge that mental health can be a sensitive subject. Reflecting on our experiences can sometimes bring up difficult thoughts and feelings, and that's normal. Be kind to yourself. Go at your own pace and take a break if you need to. If you feel you need more immediate help with your mental health and you're not sure where to go, please see the Need Help Now section of our website for details of local services who can offer support. You can find this section at www.wellbeingcollege.org.uk Resources Need Help Now. Before we start, here's what you will need for this course. A pen or pencil and paper or your favourite notebook for the activities. Whenever you see the pen symbol, it's time for you to do a short exercise. So listen to the instructions, pause the video for as long as you need to, and then hit play when you're ready to start again. I would encourage you not to skip this bit. Evidence shows that writing things down by hand helps us understand and remember concepts and makes it more likely that we will achieve our goals. Nobody is going to see what you write and you won't be asked to share it with anyone. You're just doing it for you, to get your ideas down on paper, because your ideas are the key to finding out what is going to help you. And you probably have more wisdom inside of you than you're giving yourself credit for. You may also want to eliminate distractions for the next hour or so. So if you can, switch off the TV and your phone Put on headphones if that helps you concentrate, or do what you need to do to give yourself some time to focus on you for a short while, because your mental health matters. So let's get started. We're going to begin by thinking about the word recovery and what it actually means. Don't overthink this, but simply take your pen and paper and for a couple of minutes note down any words or images that come to mind when you hear the word recovery. Again, no one is going to see this and you won't be asked to share it. This is just for you and there are no wrong answers. Pause the video while you note down your thoughts and click play when you're ready to move on. How did you get on? When I did this exercise, I thought about phrases like getting back what was lost, 
returning to normal, whatever normal feels like, feeling like me again, feeling stronger or more able to manage. There may be a sense of restoring something that you feel you have lost, or perhaps a sense of feeling better able to cope with current circumstances. Perhaps recovery has the sense of an ongoing journey, or maybe it feels more like a destination. You will know you have recovered when you get somewhere and life feels and looks a certain way. Or maybe it's about managing life's ups and downs. Life and your mental health still has its challenges and difficulties, but like the surfer here, you are more able to ride the ups and downs of the waves. Perhaps some of these words and images make sense to you, perhaps they don't, and that's okay. Recovery is as individual as you are, and there is probably no one definition that suits everyone. But here is a definition from the Scottish Recovery Network, which you may find helpful. They define recovery as being able to live a meaningful and satisfying life as defined by each person in the presence or absence of symptoms. It is about having control over and input into your own life. Each individual recovery, like his or her experience of the mental health problems or illness, is a unique and deeply personal process. This definition may speak to you, it may not, and there are many other definitions out there. So feel free to pause the video again if you need more time to reflect on this and consider how it applies in your life. Now that we've thought a little bit about mental health recovery as an idea, I'd like to introduce you to the Chime Principles. We have already noted that mental health recovery is a very individual experience, unique to every one of us. But research suggests that there are certain common themes that support us towards better mental health, and these are captured in the acronym CHIME. The Scottish Recovery Network provides some helpful definitions of these principles, which I will be referring to throughout the course, and details of their website will be provided at the end if you'd like to explore these ideas further. In summary, CHIME stands for connectedness, hope and optimism, identity, meaning and empowerment. Connectedness is about having good relationships and positive connections with other people. Hope is about having an optimistic view of the future and the belief that a better life is possible. Identity is about having a positive sense of self. Meaning refers to the things that give us a sense of meaning and purpose in life. And empowerment is about focusing on our strengths and taking responsibility for and control of our lives. Over the remainder of the course, we're going to consider each of these themes and provide you with the opportunity to reflect on how they impact your recovery. Let's start with the theme of connectedness and consider what this means. Look at the phrases on the next slide. Imagine you are the person thinking or feeling these things. For each phrase, decide whether you would feel connected to others or not. Note down an answer of yes or no for each phrase. I know people care for and look out for me. I feel I can be honest to others when I'm feeling low. I don't want to be a bother to others. My friends come to me for advice and support when they feel down. I feel no one understands me. Letting others see the real me feels scary. I just want to hide away in bed and not go out some days. I know there is a local group where I can meet people and have a coffee and a chat. If you were someone thinking or feeling these things, you would probably feel a sense of connection when you know people care for and look out for you. And when you feel you can be honest with others about how you are feeling. These are about the ability to trust others and be open about how we are feeling. Not feeling we always have to be entertaining or funny. We can have bad days too and share our troubles. Knowing there is a local group where we can meet people and have a coffee and a chat is about feeling a sense of community. Even just knowing there are others out there whom we can meet up with can make us feel connected. When we know friends or colleagues can come to us for advice and support when they feel down, that shows that we are trusted and relied upon by others and can perhaps turn to them sometime when we need to. 
These phrases, however, suggest we are feeling disconnected from others. When we feel no one will understand us, or we are reluctant to let others see how we are really feeling, we are perhaps fearful of judgment or rejection of some kind. When we want to hide away from the world and not go out, we can feel very removed from other people. Equally, not wanting to be a bother to others prevents us from sharing our problems. It's worth noting that boundaries are important in all relationships. Sometimes it isn't always appropriate to share the details of what we are going through with someone. But at the same time, pretending everything is always okay with us and never being vulnerable with others denies them the opportunity to really get to know us and help us in the ways that they would like to. With all this in mind, I invite you to take a moment to think about the positive relationships in your life. What makes them positive? How can you increase feelings of connectedness in your life? To give you an example, you may have a good relationship with somebody because of shared interests or experiences. Perhaps there are others in your life you could connect with in a similar way because of a mutual hobby. Pause the presentation for as long as you need to and note down your thoughts. There is no right or wrong answer to what will personally make you feel more connected to others. We are all individual and perhaps feeling connected to others is not necessarily about the quantity of the relationships we have more than the quality of them. Some ways in which we might feel more connected to others might include having a greater willingness to trust others, being a little more vulnerable and open with those we trust. We don't have to tell everyone everything all the time, but maybe we can risk sharing a little more of how we are feeling and give people the opportunity to get to know us better. We can try practicing greater empathy towards others. Often it's what people need the most. We could also take steps to meet people more and widen our social circle, take up a new hobby or join a club of some kind, perhaps. What else can you think of? What would work in your life? If you have any further ideas, write them down before we move on. In summary, connectedness is about having good relationships and being connected in positive ways to other people. This includes support between peers with experience of mental health issues and relationships with carers, friends and family. Positive connections with health professionals and community involvement are also important. The next theme in our journey through the Chime Principles is hope and optimism. Having a sense of hope and an optimistic outlook for the future is central to recovery. A sense that things can and will get better can help us stay motivated as we navigate our recovery and help us look forward to the time ahead of us. As this quote reads, let your hopes, not your hurts, shape your future. With this spirit of optimism in mind, let's move on to our next activity. Taking hold of your pen and paper again, take a minute or two to note down any positive changes you would like to make in your life, however big or small. Challenge yourself to list at least five, but by all means write as many as you wish. If you need a prompt, try completing the sentence, wouldn't it be great if I could, for example, find a new hobby I love, or wouldn't it be great if I could take more exercise? Try not to censor yourself or worry if your ideas are realistic or not ambitious enough. Hopes both big and small are valid here. The point is just to practice feeling a bit more hopeful about your future. What did you come up with? Some hopes might include changing my diet for the better, becoming fitter, valuing myself more, improving my confidence, finding a new job or career, or perhaps volunteering. It could be anything that makes you look forward to the future, even in a small way. The reason I asked you to do that exercise is that hope and optimism are central to recovery. If you wonder what hope and optimism look and feel like, it can be characterised by belief in recovery, motivation to change, having hope-inspiring relationships, positive thinking and valuing success, having dreams and aspirations. With this in mind, look at your own list. Is there anything you would like to add? Pause the video and note down any more ideas if you need to.
Now we are going to consider the concept of identity, the idea of having a positive self-image. We're going to start by thinking about all the things that make up a person's identity. In a moment, I'll invite you to think about someone you know well and list all the many ways in which you could identify them as being them. But let's start with an example. This is a photo I simply took from the internet. I don't know this person, but I'm simply using my imagination to demonstrate how we might think about the idea of someone's identity. For example, we could think about physical characteristics, things we can see and observe about them. We can see this person is black, female, and judging by her height relative to the board, I'm going to say quite tall. Next, we could consider her education or profession. So in this image, I might guess she is some sort of teacher or trainer and may have college or university qualifications, perhaps. We can also consider a person's skills and talents. In my example here, I'm guessing this person is good at public speaking, perhaps pretty good at planning and organising, and a good communicator in general. How about her hobbies and interests? I'm guessing here again, but perhaps she loves music, or maybe she enjoys reading fiction, or loves cooking Italian food. But now it's over to you. For this next activity, I invite you to think of someone you really admire and either know quite well or know a lot about. It could be a friend or family member or someone whose work you admire or even a celebrity. But pick someone you know a fair bit about or at least can make some educated guesses. What makes up their identity? Consider physical characteristics, personality, education and profession, skills, talents and interests, their culture, heritage, ethnicity, their belief system, and anything else that makes them who they are. Pause the video and list as many things as you can about them as if you were describing them to somebody else. When you finish your list, move on to the next slide. How did you get on? Did it take you long to write your list? Going back to my example, I have made some guesses here to demonstrate the idea of identity. And here is the start of the list I came up with. Had I known this person well, I could probably have come up with a lot more. For now, I have identified that she is female, with dark hair and skin, black American, because I took the photo from an American website, middle-aged, a teacher, trainer of some kind, educated, married, a mother, auntie, daughter, friend, a volunteer for a children's charity, she enjoys cooking, loves live music, plays piano and sings, loves cats, hates flying and is a good public speaker. What if she then had a mental health illness? Perhaps the person you were thinking of does too. How do you feel seeing bipolar added to the list? As we can hopefully see from this exercise, People have many qualities, attributes and traits that make them who they are, and mental illness may be one of them. It's perhaps worth noting that a mental illness can be a part of someone's identity, but not the sum total of it. Perhaps each aspect of our identity has more or less significance at different times in our lives. The Scottish Recovery Network summarises the relationship between identity and recovery when it says, Regaining a positive sense of self and identity, overcoming stigma and being recognised as a whole person, rather than being defined by illness or diagnosis, is another common theme of recovery. It's a powerful idea and something perhaps worth thinking about. So we've looked at three of the Chine principles, connectedness, hope and optimism, and identity. Now we're going to consider the idea of meaning. What gives meaning to our lives is one of life's big questions, and one that people can struggle with from time to time. It's quite understandable to feel that our lives lack meaning when going through a difficult time. Sometimes life's events force us to stop and question what matters to us. That certainly happened to James, whose story you are going to hear in the following video. I invite you to watch his story and take note of how he found meaning in his life following his diagnosis.
Some of the key themes we found when we looked into recovery in our research were around things like having a positive identity. That came out as very important. Um, other, another aspect was the, the extent to which people can develop meaning and purpose in their lives. Um, and by that we meant what are the things that people do to give their lives a, a, a direction, to give their lives a focus. Very lucky to have with us this morning Mr. James McKillop and James is going to talk to us about the lived experience of having dementia. He offers us several things really. He, he gives us that idea of the lived experience which is so important. He um, gives us ideas on what we could do for people with dementia and of course he's a very powerful advocate for people with dementia. Around about 1992 I noticed problems with my memory. It was quite a stressful time at work and I found I couldn't remember how to do procedures I had done hundreds of times before. Today I came to Hamilton campus to speak to mental health nurses. They deal with all sorts of mental health issues, dementia is one of them. So I was able to tell them my story of how de dementia developed, how I got over it and how I'm leading a good quality life now. So maybe I'd maybe put something down and go upstairs, come back and it was gone. Now I say, who moved that? We didn't touch it. I said, you must have touched it, you must have moved it. I left it there. And of course, uh, with hindsight, the hand touched it, it was myself. I'd put it down and forgotten. I didn't actually strike my wife, but I'd go right up to her face and bawl and shout and throw things and, you know, be a right madman. My wife does a talk in which she says, she and my children feared me coming home. She said she could understand if I was ill, as the changes in me were not the old James, but there was no hint that I might be labouring under an illness. Once I've been diagnosed and received treatment, it changed my life. It, uh, I started doing things, my behavioural problems disappeared, and I started to enjoy life. My wife and I now enjoy a much better relationship than I did before dementia. It was only due to the fact that we told get treatment. Life had deteriorated so much that I was reduced to sitting at home staring at a blank TV screen. I couldn't even be bothered to switch it on. I was deeply depressed and couldn't be bothered to change clothes, wash or save, shave as I had stopped going out. One of the things with dementia that I always advocate is exercise in your brain. It's the old idea is use it or lose it. That, uh, that this is part of keeping me going. I would now like to draw your picture of what I am doing with that support comparing to compared to what I was doing before diagnosis. Most of us have been told you've got dementia, next please, put it out the door and there's a big black hole in front of you and you didn't know what to do or where to go and I thought this was wrong. So two others and I got our heads together and we brought out this booklet which I'm very proud of. I've written quite a few magazine and book articles. Uh, there's, I've got one here. I couldn't tell you what I've written in here because it's that long ago. When I went out with this uh, support worker from Alzheimer's Scotland, they got me interested in photographs again. They got me retrained to take my... Uh, I've forgotten, sorry. This is what you get blanks. My camera. They got, they got me retrained to use my camera. Uh, this is a book of photographs here called Opening Shutters, Opening Minds. In it I try to say in the foreword that do something, take up something to uh, stimulate your mind. It doesn't have to be photographs, it can be drawing, sculpting, painting, uh, doing articles, poetry. It's to encourage people to do something to enrich their lives. I could quite easily lie in bed all day, but, uh, but, but having places to go to, meetings to go to, people to meet, it gives me a purpose in life. It gives me something to get out of bed for. One thing I do is recognise my limitations. The last time I worked in my daughter's car, she wanted uh, engine oil put in, and I put in washing up liquid. So she wasn't very pleased. And she was frothing. <laughs> <laughs> so things that I used to do, I don't do them. But it didn't stop me doing an awful lot of other things. How did the transformation from the empty sheet to the full sheets happen? How did the recluse get back a reasonable quality of life? It certainly didn't happen by chance. 
It was due to my receiving person-centred help. Now the question you must be asking yourselves, am I a one-off? Am I unique? I have dementia, yet I'm able to achieve positive things in my life. The answer is a resounding no. I have seen others like myself receive person-centred help, and likewise they have blossomed. We, uh, on our mental health programme here, James, uh, one big model or approach that informs it is the recovery model. Mm -hmm. And a central element of the recovery model is the idea of hope and hopefulness. And you, to me, personify that. I mean, somebody who comes to talk about uh, a topic like dementia, the lived experience of dementia, and laces his talk with humour mm -hmm. and with an, a, an exploration of the arts and photography, what can you say? It's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. And can we thank James in the usual way? I'll never get better at dementia. Dementia is a deteriorating illness. I could only get worse. My recovery is that I'm making the best of my life, I'm enjoying my life while that progression takes place. I don't know about you, but I found that video very moving and inspiring, as did my colleagues. There's a lot we could take from it, but when it comes to the idea of meaning, we can see that James found meaning despite being very depressed after his dementia diagnosis. He was able to help others facing a similar diagnosis by creating an information booklet and encouraging them to exercise their minds. He learned a new skill of photography and shared that skill with others. He also learned to accept his limitations, no more fixing his daughter's car, and focus on the things he could do. He is still able to achieve positive things which give his life meaning. What gives your life meaning won't be the same as it is for James. It could be friends, family, hobbies, interests, perhaps work or volunteering, or life's little pleasures like your favourite meal or time spent in nature. Take a moment to reflect on what gives your life meaning and note down any thoughts if you wish. To summarise, we can see that living a meaningful and purposeful life is important for recovery and we all find meaning in different ways. Some people find spirituality important, while others find meaning through employment or the development of stronger interpersonal or community links. In other words, relationships with friends, family and others in our community. Many people also find it important to feel valued and contribute as active members of the community. I hope you can take some time to discover what brings meaning to your life. Lastly, we're going to look at the theme of empowerment. This, if you remember, is about focusing on our strengths and taking responsibility for and control of our lives. And focusing on our strengths is where we're going to start. So time to meet pen with paper again and ask yourself two questions. Firstly, how do you look after your well-being? Think of everything you already do to take care of yourself or make yourself feel better, even in the smallest of ways. For example, Maybe you make sure you eat breakfast every day, or go for a walk in nature. Perhaps you make a point of sharing your troubles with a friend, or watching a favourite TV show. Include everyday things you may not feel are significant, like brushing your teeth or showering. If it helps, think of everything you have done today to enable you to study this course, and make sure you include Learning with the Wellbeing College on your list. Secondly, when it comes to looking after your well-being, what would you like to do more of? Perhaps you're good at taking care of your daily exercise, but would like to spend more time with friends. It might be helpful to look back at the notes you have taken throughout the course to give you ideas. I wonder how you found that exercise. I hope you managed to give yourself credit for all the things you can do right now, and for how far you've come in looking after your well-being. Sometimes we forget to acknowledge ourselves for all the things we have overcome and continue to overcome in life. But the more we can do that, the more empowered we can feel to face our challenges in the future. To summarise, 
Empowerment means, as we have just discovered, focusing on our strengths, but also taking personal responsibility for and control of our lives. Developing and using self-management techniques is one way to gain more control, as is taking an active role in decisions about your treatment and support. Making the decision to do this course today and following it through to the end is another example of empowerment, so be sure to acknowledge yourself for that. So those are the five chime principles, but let's remind ourselves of them again. We have thought about connectedness and the importance of having positive, supportive relationships in our lives. We have considered hope and optimism, the importance of having conviction that things can and will get better, and of having hopes and dreams to look forward to. We've looked at the idea of positive self-identity and all the many things that make us the individuals we are. We have thought about what gives meaning to our lives. And finally, we've looked at how we can be more empowered when it comes to improving our well-being. And in the spirit of empowerment, I invite you to think about what you can take away from today. Which of these principles really resonate with you? Is there just one thing you can do to help you on your way to better mental health? Perhaps you can reach out to a friend or family member or a professional. Maybe you can act on one of your hopes or think about a hobby or interest you want to develop that gets you in touch with one of your talents. Maybe it's as simple as taking some time to reflect on your uniqueness. What makes you, you? We consider what matters to you, such as spending more time with family. Look at the list of things you want to do more of to take care of your well-being and start with something small and manageable, like taking a short walk every day. Thank you for staying with me to the end of the course. Here is a reminder of what we have learned today. We have looked at what mental health recovery means by considering various definitions of recovery and considering what recovery might mean to you. We have looked at the chime principles of connectedness, hope, identity, meaning and empowerment and their role in mental health recovery. And finally, we've looked at ways to apply these principles in your own life. If you would like to find out more about the Chime Principles and what supports recovery, you may wish to look at the Scottish Recovery Network website. For general information about mental health, the MIND website is also an excellent resource. This may be the end of the course, but hopefully not the end of our time with you. Please look at our website where you can register for more of our courses. You can also contact us to request an appointment with a personal tutor to find out more about the college and perhaps develop a personal learning plan. If you're not already on our email list, please sign up to receive our newsletter so we can stay in touch. We'd also really love your feedback on this course, so please feel free to send us an email and tell us what you think. You will find all our contact details at the bottom of our website's homepage, where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Thank you again for taking the time to work through this course and for being willing to learn about your mental health. Thank you too for being part of the Wellbeing College. We look forward to learning with you again soon.